anyone can pull data. Anyone mm-hmm. can look at stuff. You can be really good at pivot tables. You can be really good at formulas. At the end yeah. of the day, you can present numbers and say, okay, here are the numbers. And people will say, okay, but what does that mean? The real mm-hmm. value comes from the insight that you can bring from it. Like, what's the story? Is this good? Is this bad? What's the contextual information? Welcome everyone to Tech Guide Podcast, where we give actionable advice to those wanting to break into tech or are looking for their next gig. We have Fran Gonzalez, Cause Analytics Manager at Bleacher Report on the podcast today. Fran, super excited to have you on. This is going to be so, so awesome. Thank you for being here. So excited, Ryan. Thank you for inviting me. Can't wait to hone in and talk a lot about me and the tech life. So thanks for the invite. Yes, we're excited to have you. I've been a huge fan of Bleacher Report since like 2015, 2016. And like the content you guys put out is awesome. So I'm actually excited to speak with someone from Bleacher Report. And because this is going to be a conversation all about like sports and analytics, we got to start with sports. Let us start where your love from sports comes from. Is there a specific moment where it was just like always growing up you like sports? Or is there a moment that where you're like, wow, like I'm attached? Yeah, definitely. So I'm I'm from Mexico City originated. Um, I think just that makes sports really important for us we grew up watching soccer loving soccer like i played soccer on the streets with my friends whenever we didn't have a soccer ball we would use a coca-cola can just like put it together and just play with that or whatever we could find um and i think that's just part of being mexican um another part of it if i can tell like one occasion that really like opened up my eyes to like um to the sports world is back in the day i think it was in the 90 eight or so we were playing the um against brazil in in a final mexico brazil that you would never expect for that to happen and we actually beat them and i was probably like six years or something like that uh, but i just remember that moment so vividly because we went up then they turned it around and then we actually beat them and it was just like this massive celebration so probably like that's when soccer for me became so big and since then it's just been a roller coaster of learning new sports playing new sports um, working on it. So for me, it's like my biggest passion. What's so funny is about like young memories is like, you always like just remember something from like when you're like five or six and like, if you feel like it just shapes you, I feel like for you, like that would be a specific moment where it just shapes your love for a sport. I'm also a big fan of tennis. I played tennis yeah. a lot when I was a, a kid, um, competed in a few tournaments back home. And I also always have this, um, memory of like Andy Roddick winning the U S open and his serve was just one of the strongest and fastest that I've ever seen. It's probably still one of the most record. Um, so that's also one of the ones that I would like highlight. Now yeah. that you're in the United States, have you pick up have you picked up pickleball then? I feel like there's a great synergy from going from tennis right into pickleball. <laughs> I actually haven't. A lot of people have told me about pickleball and obviously it's everywhere. Um, but I haven't tried it just yet. Maybe I'm a little hesitant because I don't think it's like tennis. Yeah. Uh, but maybe I'll go and I'll dominate. I don't know. I, I have to try it. Um, I, I'll tell you in the next time you invite me over. Yes, absolutely. I want to speak from experience. I play pickleball mm-hmm. and people that have transitioned from tennis to pickleball are super good. So Ooh. there's a lot of untapped potential there for you to just walk on that court and actually dominate right away. Oh, okay. I'm going to do that. I'm going to start throwing some bets down too. Yeah, I love that. And I want to talk about a favorite sporting event too. You just okay. talked about like ones that you've watched, but is there a favorite sporting event that like comes to mind that you've actually attended? I was going to say the World Cup, but I've never, the FIFA World Cup, but I've never been. Um, so it would have to be Wimbledon tennis. Um, That's sweet. I went there maybe like, what was it, three years ago or two years ago, and that was re- super cool. And actually in that same summer, I went to the Euros for soccer also in, in so London. Sweet. So I was able to do both things. So I would probably say those two. I would say we, so we love the UK for sporting events is what I'm oh, hearing. Yeah. yeah. I'm a massive <laughs> UK fan. Everything. Yeah. I love that. And so you've combined this love for sports and mm-hmm. now you've combined it with analytics and let's start about how you got in analytics. I don't want to ruin the story here, but can you take us through to like what you were first interested in after college, then your pivot and then your pivot again into data? Absolutely. Yeah. So I'll, I'll backtrack to how I got to where I'm at. Um, I was living in Mexico. I moved to the U S for college. Uh, moved to Washington, D.C., and um, I studied there. And basically, that was my first foray into, like, U.S. sports, right? Because those yeah. sure, there's a big NFL and football um, fan base in Mexico. But for me, it wasn't one of those. I'm not from a big um, NFL family. 
But when I got there, I was exposed to obviously the um, the Redskins back then, um, the Capitals, um, the Nationals, basically all the yeah. terrible teams that <laughs> fans have actually won stuff. Um, not the commanders yet, but hopefully. I got there and I, I started studying international relations, so politics. So that was okay. a big, big interest of me. And Washington, D.C. was a perfect place to do it, just exposed with like all the embassies, the political capital of the world, let's say. Um, so I started working on that. It's still one of my passions. I love history. I love so cool. learning about how different countries interact with one another, maybe because that I'm kind of a bit of a nomad that I've lived in different countries as well. Um, so that's where I first started. Um, I would go to DC United games. I would go to the um, Nationals games and kind of piqued my interest a little bit. Started working in the international political um, environment, doing actually fiscal, basically taxes. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. No offense. Yeah. yeah no, exactly. That was exactly it. Um, it was an it was an interesting experience because it was the first time that I was actually working, um, getting a salary, getting a paycheck, and I enjoyed it because I was learning mm. something new. But it it got um, boring really quickly. So like two yeah. years in, I was like, you know what, this isn't for me. Let's try something else. And actually, around the same time, I had an internship at New York City Football Club, which is a mm. soccer team out there. Um, and I was in the marketing team, basically doing a lot of like translations um community events stuff like that and i absolutely loved it so Mm. it's like you know what i'm not enjoying this part but at the same time i am i know that sports for me is a big passion so what can i do so i decided to pivot which is something that a lot of people do and a lot of people are afraid of doing um at the moment at the time i didn't know if i should be doing it if it was the right move i was moving to an industry where i didn't have experience yeah it was like you know what i have to because this is what i really like uh-huh. Um, so I decided to move to Spain, um, to Barcelona, where uh, wow. it's one of the biggest sporting cities in the world. Um, and basically I did a master's there in sports management. That took me to learning a lot about the industry and also a lot of classes on analytics, um, social media, stuff like that. And kind of opened a world for me that was just basically super, super cool. From there, I came back to the U.S. and Mexico and... It's a really tough industry to get into. I, I can tell yeah. you that now it took me a long time to find a job there. Um, and there's a point where you have to like, um, you got to be realistic, right? I can't just keep searching for this pipe dream. I might not get it. So I need to yeah. pay my bills. I need to get a job. Um, so that took me to uh, a job that actually helped me get into the analytics world, which was uh, in mar- uh, market research. So basically mm. it was doing a lot of surveys, analyzing, interpreting data, um, pitching to clients and basically telling them what are good industries to to study, right? And emerge yep. and kind of open up. And that took me to another job doing the same thing in the US and eventually helped me get into Bleacher Report because it allowed me, gave me skills, strong skills in interpreting data, analyzing big data sets and telling a story, right? At the end of the day, you want to be able to impact um, stakeholders, fan bases, um, just people with yeah. numbers and, and make them pop, really tell a story. Um, so that's kind of how I got there. I know it's a, a little bit of a long winded answer, but it, yeah. it just showcases how sometimes life is not direct and you have to take some back, um, back roots, but you eventually get there, you know? So but uh, there is a lot there. Um, and I want to talk about the part about like the market research. So you came from Spain to Mexico and working in market research because it's hard to break into the industry initially. So I'm curious, how did you then identify Bleacher Report? Uh, you had this market research experience. And then how did you identify Bleacher Report? Was it just a job posting? And then what did that process look like and the transferable skills? That's over? That's a good question. I always had it in the in like the in the back of my head that I wanted something like that. I actually mm. was also pretty close to doing, going to a competitor. I'm not going to name who it was, but at the end of the day, it didn't work out. And I'm yeah. glad it didn't work out because I'm very happy where I'm at. And basically um, we, it's, it's just content that I really resonate with, right? Yeah. Um, but it basically was, I kind of got tired of, of where I was at beforehand. I needed to change. That happens after a few months yeah. or years. And um, I just needed a change. And I started looking, actually, I was on LinkedIn and there was a job posting I tried and Two days after I had a call, it's like, hey, do you want to interview wow. with us? Yeah, I got really lucky very quickly. And I think they were closing the job posting maybe like that day or something. And I, I got right in. Um, and it was a pretty long process. I wouldn't, it probably took me a few months, maybe like six months or so from wow. start to finish. 
yeah, I also went through like holidays, winter breaks, stuff yeah. like that. So it's understandable. <clears throat> I wasn't in any rush to join. So it kind of panned out for me. But uh, yeah, it's basically a long, really process to really, really leverage and, and understand whether you're the right fit. And I yeah. think it makes a huge difference because you can really be impactful from the day, from the first day, you know. But at the end of the day, it was just a LinkedIn post. Yeah. Well, what's super interesting about, I feel like this LinkedIn post in particular, mm-hmm. you have one pillar of Bleacher Report. Mm-hmm. You have one pillar of sports. You have another pillar of like analytics. You combine yeah. all of those, you're going to get a lot of applications. I oh, imagine yeah. this thing had over 500 yes. almost. I don't even want to ask. Yeah. I, yeah. And But you're the one that got the position. And so yeah. let's speak of that a little bit more like... I don't want to throw it at you. Like, mm-hmm. why did you get the position? But is there something that like made you really stand out in like the interview process? Was it like your interview skills, your ability to tell yeah. a story with analytics? Is there something that you think really made you stand out? I think that's, I think that's a good question. As I mentioned, it took quite a few months. There was a lot of steps where like you're meeting different people, hiring managers, yeah. the team. And so, so I feel like through those different channels, you have to kind of be show different skills. Right. So in the first one, it was really a, for me about like, making an impact. I yeah. knew I was coming into like a sporting environment. So like my background on Google chat and the video was basically a, a stadium. It was the old Trafford stadium for Manchester United, which is my team. Um, I had it there. And so like the first reaction that I got from the hiring manager was like, Oh, so you're a football fan or a soccer yeah. fan. You like Manchester United. So that kicked off right there. Right. That's so like really I had something to talk about, um, made me different. And he's also a big, fan of sports and, and Premier League football. So it was, it was, it was just perfect. Right. So that would be one, one thing that I like, I'm very proud. And I, I get, I, I calculated and did it and it worked out, but also try to be as casual as myself as possible. Sometimes mm-hmm. when you start being just very too much into your head, um, when you need something or you, you kind of can come up desperate, you might not yeah. be the person that they're looking for. So I would always like suggest people to be themselves, talk about what they know. If they don't know an answer, you know what? Honestly, I'm not sure, but I can check, yeah. which also shows that you're willing to get the work done. Um, so that would be the first part. Um, another thing that probably made me stand out is we had to do like a big, um, basically like a case study or report just to showcase your skills. Um, mm. I would say... I dove into that with everything that I had. I put a lot yeah. of work into it. I got I a bet. lot of feedback. I a lot of different views. Try to present a lot of times beforehand, just to make sure that I'm giving it the the right amount of time that it deserved. Right? If I really yeah. wanted this job, I had to put the graft in. Can you um, share so, what that project was by chance, yeah, or just so like a high level? Yeah. For example, so like my job nowadays, um, it's essentially analyzing content. So like, as you mentioned, Bleacher Report posts a lot of content on yeah. Instagram, YouTube, and so on. And we have to analyze its performance, see if it, how many people liked it, how many people shared it, um, whether people are resonating with it or not. Right. So there was a case study of a big tent pole event that we had essentially looking at it saying, what did we do right? What did we not do right? How mm. can we improve? So it's, you go into a lot of different metrics. You look at viewership you look at um engagements that's so cool um, stuff like that 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 I, for me it's very easy to like i'm a very social instagram person yeah, so yeah it's something that i knew um so it was easy for me to grab those numbers and basically talk to them about it because i'm passionate about it so yeah it was like just basically looking at different ways which you can tell the story of this didn't necessarily do well or bad but how yeah. can you make it better whether it performed great or it performed terribly so like distilling those things, looking yeah, yeah. at it qualitatively, quantitatively, um, that, those were the things that I had to do. A lot of this is like data and storytelling. And I know that's something you're mm-hmm. super passionate about. And so let's just say you grab like all this data, like you aggregate all this data, you cleaned it all up. What are some of the most effective ways you've used to actually like then present this data to stakeholders? Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's the hardest part of the job. Um, yeah. <laughs> because anyone can pull data. Anyone mm-hmm. can look at stuff. You can be really good at pivot tables. You can be really good at formulas. At the end of the day, you can present numbers and say, okay, here are the numbers. And people will say, okay, but what does that mean? The real value comes from the insight that you can bring from it. Like what's the story? Is this good? Is this bad? What's the contextual information? Um, And for me, the way in which I try to look at it is 
for, um, always try to look at something that for me looked good on, let's, let's say we're talking about one content piece on yeah, yeah. Facebook. What did I like about this? Okay. You know what? I love the color scheme. Yeah. What did I not like about this? Okay. Um, it's really long. Honestly, I can't watch for five minutes. Okay. So I always try to find something that's bad, something that's good. Um, and then open it up in a larger lens. What does this mean for a larger audience? So, okay, I can see the content piece and it's it looks good, but at yeah. the end of the day, is it telling what we wanted to tell? So like there was this, um, the Dolphins the other day absolutely destroyed the Broncos. Yep. <laughs> um, so if you post something, what are you trying to attain? Are you trying to humiliate the other or fan base? Uh... No, you're basically just, we're news, right? So we're just trying to tell a story of what happened, but do it always in the lens of what's the objective. So if you bring the bad things that happen to it, the good things that, and then what the objective, you're going to be able to bring something that maybe people didn't realize or didn't look at. So that's kind of the way in which I look at things specifically for this, um, for my job and just storytelling and insights in general. That's really cool. So you're, you're really starting with like the objective in mind there then yeah. of yeah. like what story we want to tell then. Exactly. And sometimes like you, it, it might be that like your objective is raising awareness, right? Um, yeah. Maybe being like more diverse, having different mindsets, but maybe that's not going to give you great numbers. That's fine. If yeah, you're yeah. getting the objective of having more women's sports, having more Absolutely. diversity in um, all of those things, then you don't really care that much about the numbers. Sure. It's important, but what's the main objective is, getting people to talk about or, or realize what's happening. You know? Yeah. That was the main, that was literally like the um, example I was going to give is like women's mm -hmm. sports. Like mm -hmm. it might not get all the numbers, but it is from my mind, like an awareness play. So like, maybe you're not going to get a million likes or whatever it is at Bleacher Report, yeah. but like it, it is the awareness. And I think that's really important for a platform like Bleacher Report to have that in mind to actually mm -hmm. mobilize. And mm -hmm. they do a really nice, and I mean, you do a really nice job of doing that. I'd say. Yeah. Um, I think it's a long-term play and you have to always kind of keep your eye on the ball. Um, but I, I, and slowly, right. It's maybe we'll, one day we'll post something. It didn't do well, but maybe the next day it'll do a little bit better. And then yeah. in two years time, and you can see in women's sports now, like the WNBA playoffs that was just this past week, they were the biggest numbers in viewership in like 30 years, something like that. Yeah. Absolutely massive. So how do we get there? Right. Um, so always having that objective and that long-term place and lens is super important. Yeah. And I feel like you're really seeing the impact of women's sports now, uh, just like with the Nebraska volleyball team example, yeah. like they oh, sold yeah. out like the football stadium, like this is a football stadium. They sold out for a volleyball yeah. match, which I think is so cool. So you really are seeing the impact of women's sports across like so many 100%. different, uh, all, all sports really. It's really cool to see. Yeah. That's awesome that you referenced that. I love that, um, that piece of news and the, just that it's happening, you know? Yeah. And so how would you go like, like, how would you go about like presenting that then? So, you know, it's an awareness play, mm -hmm. like, you know, like we want to bring awareness to it. How does that like shape the content then that you then post? Like, like, does it shape like the copywriting, like the images and all that stuff in itself? Yeah. So that's definitely like, that's less of my job and it's more of like the programming team and the strategy okay. teams that have, um, yeah, basically that those objectives very clear in their heads and they kind of have to look at things like copy things yeah. that are formatting presenting those things are super important and then they can work with me and my team to leverage like certain typical like i can analyze types of content types yeah. of captions types of format just like in a larger like in a larger scheme of things and say you know what usually they perform the best when it's this way if you format it that way and then, okay, they'll take those learnings and they'll apply it to this strategy. Right. Um, they won't see the same numbers possibly, possibly yeah. they will. Um, but basically that's how we would interact together. Interesting. A question just came in mind. I'm really curious okay. about, so let's just kind of like break down. What are some of the numbers you would present to like the CEO of Bleacher Report compared to like some of like the programmers, if a CEO uh, Bleach Report, I, I don't know his or her yep. name, but like if they said like, hey, we need you to present some numbers on just like how our general social media is going, like what are some of the key metrics you would look for? Absolutely. So I would say definitely like how many people we, we reach, um, mm. how do we compare to other main competitors, right? Because um, you have, they obviously know the big numbers, the budgets, the revenue and stuff like that. So you yeah. want to be able to give them a big shiny number that they can go and, and use for... <laughs> growth strategy and stuff like that. You don't need to get too 
honed into the details of one particular post or run. Yeah. Um, so you always got to make it clear, very um, simple, I would say. Um, yeah. Because those are the things that they're going to, they also are pretty busy people. So you need to make sure that it's very concise and very impactful with, you have five seconds for them. What do they need to know? What's the most important part, right? Um, so I would definitely talk about reach. I would talk about engagements, which is a big metric for us. Like yeah. How many people actually engage with their content? Um, and then just be as concise as possible. Whenever we're talking about programmers, you can get a lot more gritty nitty because they're very in there every single day. So you can talk about um, length of videos. You can be talking about um, how many likes versus how many shares. Interesting. How you get to those audiences. Um, so stuff like that. Yeah, that's really cool. Is there a post that comes to mind of like the past like year that had like a crazy amount of engagement? Oh, yeah. So um, at the end of the NBA playoffs, um, basically the Milwaukee Bucks got eliminated, right? Yep. Um, and they were asking Giannis, their star player, basically like, would you say this is a failure to your, because oh. you got eliminated? And so he responded very well, very, very well. He talked about like, why would it be failure for them to get to that point? And then do you all every single day make, let's say, a lot of money? Do you every single day meet every single of your goals? Do you win mm -hmm. the World Cup every single? No. So that doesn't mean you're a failure. You just mean like you're working towards it and you got to a really important part. So we were talking about those types of things and we posted it in our crosser channels and it blew up because it's something that people can resonate with yep. whether you're an NBA fan or not. And I think that's at the end of the day, the important part. Um, getting those stories across. And that's also a really good way of growing your audience. I know the exact clip you're talking yeah. about. And if anyone's listening, definitely go check it out. Cause that is like, I saw that so many times, but you never mm -hmm. get sick of it. It's like something you get chills about just like watching. And Absolutely. that's what I think is like so amazing about sports is like, just like those like little clips and like story you can really share in sports. And that's why I think people just connect with sports so well is because it is a great story in itself. Um, and the production's amazing. The wow. media is amazing. There's so much to love about sports. And that is one reason why is the stories you can share. I agree. It connects people. Like at the end of the day, like I'm from Mexico City. You're from, um, you said Ohio, or Iowa. Iowa, Iowa, oh, Iowa, Ohio. Ohio. Same thing. Tomato, tomato. <laughs> um, so like we're two people that are from different places, and at the end of the day, we're here resonating, relating on sports and analytics. So like it has that power to draw audiences in. I think that's super cool. Yeah, and I do want to talk about your international background as well, mm -hmm. and like bringing it to America and just like American sports in general. What has been like? I don't know, like the biggest surprise or what has been like the biggest thing in America sports that has like surprised you? I would say show business. Like they, yeah. they, the American sports industry is just knows how to put a show. Seriously. Like they bring up all the stops. They think about everything. So they're thinking about cheerleaders. They're thinking about um, you're coming out with all like the fireworks. You're coming out with what's the experience for the ads. Like, the halftime show, like yeah, all yeah. those things across the world aren't that important. You just go, you go to the game. Maybe you have like, wow. Like I, I always find it funny that I go to Mexico and I watch a soccer game and the halftime show is basically this guy um, trying to jump through a hoop or like trying to score a goal. And that's it. Sure. That happens a lot too in, in American sports, but there's just so much more grandeur and explosiveness about things that I just, a lot of different industries around the world and sports industry in the world are looking at and trying to replicate. That is super interesting. And you are right. Like the, just the production and like the showbiz that goes on in American sports is crazy. Like I went to a, an Atlanta Falcons Panthers mm -hmm. game week one this year at Mercedes Benz, just like before the game, there's like so much like tailgating going on mm -hmm. during the game that they're, they're like raising flags. The mascot, uh, I don't know the Falcons mascot name, but he literally zip lines from like the top of oh, the, yeah. uh, the stadium, like, uh, backwards or like with his feet hanging. It was literally insane. It's just the thought that goes into it to make it a like, truly an event is like so special. And it's what makes sports so fun as well. Yeah. We posted that on Bleacher Report so you can see that there too. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like you just said, Mercedes-Benz Stadium is so cool. It's like an amazing stadium that they thought about it when they were building it. They were like, okay, can we have concerts here? Can we have um, a baseball game if we want it? If we can yeah. change it and then have like a tennis? Sure, why not? Like they're thinking about the business of it and that's something that perhaps around the world wasn't and now it's starting to happen. You now see the NFL going to London, you're going to Frankfurt, mm. um, the NBA is doing the same, they're going to Mexico. Like they're bringing it around the world to make it a business. And I think yeah. that's where other people around the world can really like learn from it and are starting to, but it's taking them a little bit longer than what the US really pioneered. 
Yeah, and I do think so. The big debate right now in uh, the NFL, of course, is turf fields. Mm-hmm. Is p- players hate turf fields? Yeah. But from a straight business perspective, it makes so much sense. Just the maintenance and to how easy it is to host like a concert on there and have the oh, turf yeah. be totally fine. So it's there's always like pros and cons with how businessy like sports can be. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, these are like like these could be forced by other companies. Yeah, like they, the owners and everything are thinking about the numbers, the analytics of it, right? Like they're thinking, you know, how can I make more money? Okay, let's do that. Is, is he going to get injured? Eh, how much am I going to lose from that injury? How much am yeah. I going to win from getting all these concerts? Okay, seriously, so. it's tough. And I think a really big opportunity for the NFL is that you just talked about is like, uh, like they're expanding into London, Frankfurt. Uh, I think they had a game in Mexico City last year, the 49ers yeah. Chiefs or 49ers uh, Raiders. And they might, I, I'm assuming they do again this year. Um, but I think that's the biggest opportunity for the NFL right now is to expand globally because the NF- NBA did it with like Jordan and uh, mm-hmm. Stern and whatnot. But I think that's the NFL has a has a long ways to go on that, but there's a lot of potential there. There's a good story there that um, a few years ago, the NFL came to Mexico City and they, they were playing at the Estadio Azteca, which is this massive coliseum. And there were terrible rains because in the summer it just rains horribly in Mexico. Yeah. Um, and it destroyed the pitch. The pitch was absolutely horrible because it, it was grass. It wasn't turf. Yeah. Um, and the NFL came to town. and was like, you know what? We're not playing here because everyone's mm-hmm. going to get injured. This is terrible. Like, So also they bring all these regulations. They start bringing different ideas that at the end of the day helps improve um wherever they're going because now there's certain regulations that the yeah if, if we want to host the nfl and come to mexico or wherever which is a huge massive business idea um well we need to improve in that aspect and so it's pushing quality control and stuff like that around the world higher so i think it's a good idea good thing yeah that's actually a really interesting point i never thought about that i'm sure the nfl then their regulations are like actually oh, insane yeah. especially yeah. If, where you go no matter where they go like i said these are players that even paid 15 million 20 million dollars a year like they want to have them be at the highest quality and the, mo- the most safe ways absolutely and i am curious um we are winding down on time here but i want to talk about like how your experience internationally has also shaped like your success in your career like is there a part of you what part of you contributes like your success um to like living at- internationally and having those experiences i would say definitely like the most important part is different perspectives um, mm. obviously traveling and living in a different place in the world, um, meeting new people, you get different ideas, different opinions, different ways of think, looking at stuff. And at the end of the day, like helps shape you into a more well-rounded person with like more open to different ideas. And I think that could be impacted whenever you're presenting to someone, cause you're more open to what they might be not thinking about at the same time, what they might, it also helps you work with teams better because you're more empathetic or maybe you're more open to their personal ideas. Um, I also think when you travel um, to other parts, you're usually no one. Yeah. Um, So you have to like really put the work in to stand up. You don't have connections, which usually at the end of the day, like connections are a great way of like getting ahead in life. So you have to work, start from the bottom. You have to work hard. And and I'm going to bring in a sports reference, but at the end of the day, like talents can get you so far. Um, I want to take use like Cristiano Ronaldo as an example. Um, he's obviously very good, but yeah. he put the work in every single day to become who he became. And so like you're, you can be very talented, but if you don't work in, um, and put that effort in every single day, that's what's going to get you to the 100%. You're going to get to the 90% with talent, but not to the 100%. And so that's one of the things that I learned, like just traveling, meeting new people, like putting in the work because you need to stand out. Um, yeah. and, you, and the best way of doing that is doing good work, being consistent, uh, working as hard as you can. Um, and so, yeah, I would definitely say those two things are ways that have shaped me from traveling um, and just being in different places. And I would recommend it to anyone if you can go and travel and try different experiences, try things that you like that you don't. Mm-hmm. Um, for my life, I did a lot of jobs that maybe I wasn't that passionate enough, Yeah. but if you don't try, you don't know. Right. Um, and you're, shouldn't be afraid to try something, not like it. Cause that, then it's going to take you to something that you do like and that you're good at. Yeah. And I think that's like really important. Like, I don't know how much, like, like how much do you think about like your core values and like your mission of like what you want to be doing? Cause I'm sure like when you're doing market research, like maybe it was great, but now I feel like, I mean, just from this conversation we have, like, I feel like you're like very aligned with like what you want to be doing and. 
I mean, how much did that shape you or like how much did you like really bring that to life is like being aligned with like what you want to do? Yeah, I think I think you you mentioned it perfectly. Uh, um, sometimes you're doing work that you're not enjoying. And so mm-hmm. it really helps to be thinking about those things because it could get, get really easy to just keep trucking, doing stuff that you don't like, <laughs> just getting the paycheck and stuff like that. Like I'm not I'm not here to tell anyone quite your job or anything like that. Not at yeah. all. <laughs> um, but if you have the opportunity and you can do it, if you think about those core values, things that are really like motivate you and make you passionate, those things are going to definitely take you to where you want to go. Even if the, the route is longer than what you expected, you're going to get there because you're passionate and you're good at what you're passionate because it'll be effortless. Yeah. Um, so like now that I'm somewhere where I'm really happy, perhaps in the past, I wasn't as happy as I was, but now like I just feel I can do my best work because I'm focusing on things that I like, that I enjoy. I don't mind maybe working a little bit later on days yeah. that, Cause, cause I like it and they enjoy it, you know? And maybe this is such an American thing, but like, like we do work so much where mm-hmm. like you should be doing something you're happy, but I have heard, and we, we are right now. And I, yeah. I want to do ask, like, has your love for sports at all diminished at all? Cause I've heard some people that work in sports, mm-hmm. maybe more of like the day-to-day operations for like an MLB team or an NFL team. They're like, yeah, like I don't like sports yeah. as much anymore. I mean, ha- have you experienced that as all? I personally haven't. I've seen that happen to people because you're just too into it every single day. I think for me, being in analytics, you're not yeah. in the operations of it ever, quite as much. So I do watch quite a bit of sports, but I don't have to watch every single thing. So that gives me that flexibility where I can still enjoy, I can still go watch a game, but it does impact the way I which I look at social media, Yeah, um, which that happens. So now, now I can't be on a, just scrolling my feed and saying, oh, this is cool. Like, I'm going to be thinking, oh, this is terribly done. They could have done this. They could have done yep, that. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> that's how I'm impacted, but less so as to like sports in per se, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I feel like uh, you're in analytics. I'm in a marketing role. Like yeah, every time you just see something, you're like, oh, maybe I would have done that a little bit different. Or you like kind yeah. of put a note in the back of your head, like, oh, I should do that. Uh, but last question for you. We typically okay. end with uh, like traits that you think anyone should have, but you already alluded to that. So mm-hmm. let's end with a little fun one here. So when it hangs up, they're done listening to this podcast. Which players highlights should they go watch first? Players highlights. Uh, what sport? Any sport. Your favorite highlights of any player. That's a great question. Um, whew. You can always go with, if, if I'm, I'm going to go with NBA right now, like just because the Damian Lillard news mm. just came through uh, two days ago, um, you got to like, you're going to enjoy just watching him play. He's just so good. Um, John Morant is always good. Yeah. And NBA highlights, like those dunks are just going to keep happening. Um, if you look at NFL, um, I mean, Brady is just Patrick Mahomes just had some yeah. amazing Dude. throws in the history. <laughs> um, and then in soccer, just fi- finishing with that, I'm going to go back to Cristiano Ronaldo, Manchester United, 08, 07 season. Like he was just destroying uh, the Premier League. He's not there anymore, but just watching those things was so good. Ah, I love that. Well, everyone, you can now end this podcast and go do those highlights. But before you do that, Fran, thank you so much for joining us today. Great episode. And thank you for all the insights you shared with us. Absolutely, Ryan. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm happy to talk to anyone else, whoever wants to reach out. 